Here we go. Okay. Good morning. Um, today's topic is super near and dear to my heart because I currently have a number of clients who are struggling um, with this topic. And so I just, I wanted to bring it up and talk about it in hopes of helping some people see this topic in a different way. So many people ask me how food gets tangled up as an emotional coping skill. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today, um, exactly how this process works. And um, I also want to sort of dip my toe into this topic of conversation gently, but lovingly saying every one of us has access to change our own feelings of self-worth. It's not an easy process um, necessarily. For some people, it's it's easier than others. Um, but I believe without a shadow of a doubt that if you struggle with self-worth, if you struggle with the feelings of worthiness or love and belonging, you there is not a single doubt in my mind that you have the ability to change that on your own, okay? So I'm gonna start off the conversation with that. You have the ability to change that, even if it doesn't feel like you do, even if you've lived that way your entire life, even if the days feel dark and you feel like, I don't know how that's ever gonna be different for me. You have agency, over your feelings of value, worthiness, and self-worth. Okay, where did this come from? Um, belonging, worthiness, and self-worth is what's called a biological imperative. We are born as human beings, and actually um, I, the science does support that, that mammals in general have this. Um, in other words, uh, other species, other, other mammals, um, you'll see this in their packs, in their tribes, that part of what keeps them alive biologically. When I say a biological imperative, I mean it is necessary for survival not just a nice to have, it is a biological imperative. It is necessary for survival. Meaning, and when there's something called a biological imperative, it means we are quite literally wired that way. And if we don't get that need met, we are at risk for death. Not, it means death, but it means we are at risk for death. So we have the wiring for connection, belonging and love, okay? So it's not just a, oh, I'd like to have love and belonging. It is a biological imperative. That's something I, I need everybody to understand. It's a biological imperative that we have love and belonging. And other mammals are wired this way as well. Um, you know, you see elephants in, in birth, um, the entire elephant tribe will surround the mother in the birth of the baby elephant. And all of the elephants will sort of trumpet and salute to the new baby to welcome them into the tribe. They belong somewhere. They are loved and they have belonging. Okay. As humans, well, all of us, um, because it's a biological imperative, we have wiring that is set up to um, let us recognize those connections between ourselves and our caregivers and other people in our lives. I won't go into all of the details about why, because we are in healthy conversations. We have about 15 minutes together today, but just know that there are cranial nerves, there are occipital nerves, there are nerves in your, um, uh, in your eardrums, there are nerves that go to your heart. There's all kinds of nerves that set us up to be wired for love and belonging. We get that love and belonging from our caregivers from birth throughout childhood. And I say caregivers because that could mean anybody. It doesn't necessarily have to be mother, father, mother, mother, father, father. It doesn't matter. Caregivers, the person who is responsible for your care is also responsible for developing your sense of love and belonging. Okay. I promise there's a reason why I'm talking about this. Just know that it is a biological imperative. It is necessary for our survival. And what that means is that your nervous system is wired in such a way that it is always searching for cues of that love and belonging. Because it's a biological imperative, it means that our body will always be looking for cues of whether or not we're getting that biological need met, okay? If you grew up in an environment where your need for love and belonging was not met, 
or was not met consistently, or perhaps that need was severed somewhere, or there was trauma somewhere, or somewhere along the way, your need for love and belonging was not met, and you did not get the messages of worthiness or value or self-worth or, you know, on and on and on. Like I said, your nervous system is always looking for whether or not that need is getting met. So here's where food comes in. For many, many people, for people who struggle with food, for many people, if they were not getting their needs met for love and belonging in somewhere or some area of their lives, food, if it became a comfort, now becomes a substitute for getting that need met. In other words, food can get tangled up in the messages of love and belonging. If your nervous system is searching for love and belonging and not finding it in your connections with others, in your family environment, in your immediate family system, it can go out and search for food to provide that comfort. Because if you, for instance, let's say you had, you found, you know, when you were a kiddo and I'm making things up, but you're parents were fighting and you used to sneak out to the kitchen and grab the popcorn and you would sit in your room and eat the popcorn and that would make you feel good, right? In an environment where you are stimulated into a negative nervous system response and you would go out and you would eat the popcorn to comfort you, you start firing and wiring a neural pathway that food is bringing you those feelings and emotions of love and belonging. Okay. And when food is bringing you those emotions of love and belonging, as I mentioned earlier, your nervous system is always searching for those cues of love and belonging. So if it was food that brought you that, it will go out and search for food unconsciously as an unconscious pathway to bring you down that pathway of where you found comfort and love and belonging. So many, many people struggle with food unconsciously as a way to make them feel love and belonging in an area of life where they feel like they're lacking or missing, okay? And so in that way, when we just say, I'm going to go on a diet or I'm going to lose weight and I'm not going to eat this, I'm not going to eat that, it our nervous system is so powerful. Its job is to keep us alive and well. It is so much more powerful than the cognitive mind that says, oh, I have a desire to lose weight, right? And so the cognitive mind can override that nervous system cue for only so long before you go back into homeostasis and habitual behaviors that say, nope, Food is my comfort. Food is my friend. Food is what gives me love and belonging. And we go back into those soothing behaviors. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this for a couple of things, for a couple of reasons. Number one, as we develop a stronger sense of love and belonging and connectedness in other areas of our lives, within ourselves, and then in other areas of our lives, our need for the food to provide the love and belonging starts to diminish on its own, okay? That's number one. And number two, like I started this conversation, everybody has the capacity to, within themselves, develop this sense of love and belonging. While as an infant or a child, it is necessary for us to ideally get that love and belonging from our caregivers, once we have reached maturity and fully developed, if you are missing love and belonging, you can, um, you have the capacity to build it within yourself, okay? And then as we build it within ourselves, we are much more likely to attract it and connect it with others. So in other words, if you didn't get your needs met as a child, you absolutely have the capacity to um, use the tools and build the skills necessary to get your needs met as an adult, okay? So when I said that the nervous system will go out and search for the love and belonging, you can be a part of building that nervous system resilience and building that sense of love and belonging within yourself. And as you do that, as you strengthen your sense of love and belonging, as you strengthen your sense of resilience, your need for food as an emotional crutch, as an emotional coping skill 
goes down significantly, if not entirely. And, and what I have seen in most of my clients is that what will happen is it will then become um, the, the, the using food as an emotional coping skill that the feeling of it changes. In other words, Whereas before it felt like it was a necessity, like if I didn't get this food, I couldn't handle the emotions that were coming up after the work is done. It feels like a alignment. It feels like embodiment so that when people choose food as coping, when they say, you know what, a piece of this delicious chocolate that I love so much just feels really comforting and soothing right now. And I'm going to have this piece and I'm really going to enjoy it. And then I'm going to sit my cup of tea and read my book. It, it plays into a more aligned embodied feeling. And it becomes clearer when that food is actually feeling good versus um, the food is necessary in order for me to be able to deal with the emotion. One comes with a sense of a lack of control. Like if I don't have the food, I'm not going to be okay. And the other comes with a sense of um, control or I don't like to use the word control, but but peace, embodiment of, oh yeah, I'm choosing to use the food because it genuinely feels good, not because I have to in order to be able to cope and survive, if that makes sense. Okay. Let me check to see if you have questions over here. No questions over here. Um, I hope that makes sense to you uh, about the pathway, the mechanism for which many people get tangled up in food as a coping skill. Uh, and then more importantly, that we all have the ability, if you are someone who feels like they struggle with worthiness or love and belonging, everyone has the ability to develop those skills and master those skills um, as an adult. Now. Don't get me wrong, it's challenging. It's a challenging process to override the consistent messages and the consistent beliefs and the consistent stories you have about your self-worth. It's it's a challenge. It takes intentional focus and it won't feel easy. But it is, I believe, my belief is that it is absolutely accessible to anyone who wants to do that work. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful for you all today. I will see you next week for more healthy conversations.